Hi, I'm Brian Trenchard-Smith and this is Trailers from Hell. Australia had three major cinema pioneers, each working in technologically inventive ways within an underfunded feature film industry. In the silent era, Raymond Longford accrued 29 directing credits, including The Sentimental Bloke, considered Australia's greatest silent movie. With the coming of sound, Ken G. Hall, sitting to the left of camera, pioneered populist comedies. The Dad and Dave series were big box office in Australia, but language and cultural differences made them a hard sell outside of England. The husband and wife team of Charles and Elsa Chevelle aimed directly at international markets with strong heroic stories set against Australia's spectacular landscapes. Their first in 1933, in the wake of the bounty, launched Errol Flynn's career. Their last, Jeddah, in 1955, was Australia's first colour film, the first to be screened at the Cannes Film Festival and the first to star Aboriginal actors. But it is 40,000 horsemen in 1940 depicting the last great cavalry charge of World War I that was their most successful. The Anzacs ride again! Three years ago, Australia's ace director, Charles Chevelle, set himself the colossal task of attempting to recreate the gallant exploits of the Australian Night Horse in Palestine. This was a passion project for Chevelle. His uncle, Sir Harry Chevelle, commanded the Australian Light Horse in Palestine when on October the 31st, 1917, they charged the Turkish fortifications guarding the wells at Bathsheba. Twenty years later, when several brigades of the Light Horse were in Sydney for a centenary celebration, Charles and Elsa Chevelle got permission to borrow them for a day and stage the charge on the Cronulla Sandhills south of the city. The footage from four cameras was spectacular enough to persuade the state government to partner with Hoyt Cinemas and put up the entire budget of £30,000. Chevelle had visited Hollywood in the silent era to learn his craft, taking any job, an extra, a lighting technician, a publicist, even a stunt double. As a result of working on westerns, he refused to use tripwires for the horse stunts. Instead, shallow pits were dug, then filled with soft sand and covered with hessian. It still looks hard on the horse, but none were injured, according to Humane Society officials who monitored the shoot. The Chevelles cast two unknown actors as the romantic leads. Grant Taylor went on to more Australian and Hollywood movies, then a solid career in British television. Betty Bryant met her husband, an MGM executive, while on a publicity tour for the movie. MGM cast her as Greer Garson's daughter in Mrs. Miniver, but she became pregnant and had to withdraw. She did little acting thereafter, but along with Peter Ustinov and Sophia Loren, she founded a charity to aid peoples of the South Pacific, which would later receive a Humanitarian Service Award from Hillary Clinton. This love scene upset the puritanical Australian censor Creswell O'Reilly, who had forced cuts on the Chevelle's previous movies. All shots of horses falling were also to be cut, as well as much of the belly dancer's gyrations. That scene highlighted the comedic talents of Chips Rafferty, whom Chevelle saw as the personification of the rugged, irreverent, laconic Australian male. Rafferty's dry, everyman style caught on, and he played much the same character for the next 30 years. His final role as the country cop in the classic Wake in Fright is considered the best of his career. The censor's ruling days before the premiere of 40,000 Horsemen was a shock. Despite evidence that no horse was injured, the censor was implacable. So Chevelle secretly arranged a screening for the minister in charge of the censor's department. The minister loved the film and overturned the ruling, restoring all cuts. Horseman opened at Christmas 1940 and broke all box office records, grossing a total of £130,000 sterling. It was just the dose of morale-boosting national pride the wartime audience needed. International critics embraced it. Yippee for brawling, boisterous entertainment, wrote the New York Times. It took £40,000 in England, unheard of for an Australian film of that time. But the Chevelles would see little of the revenue. Warned of heavy wartime taxation around the corner, they were persuaded to sell their share of the copyright for £2,000. But the film remains their proudest achievement. For further insight into early Australian filmmaking, I warmly recommend this book, The Shadow Catchers, A History of Cinematography in Australia by renowned documentarian Martha Ansara, 
It is smartly written, beautifully illustrated, and can be ordered online.